Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you very much to the organizers for allowing us to present on the Burke Cinema this afternoon. My name's Muriel Dunbar. I'm currently chair of the Burke Cinema Trust, which is the charity which owns the, the cinema and is responsible um, for its uh, continuing development within the community. And I'm joined by my colleague, the architect, the award-winning architect, I have to now say, uh, Robin Baker, who as, mo as recently, even as Tuesday, picked up yet another award for the cinema in a special mention of the Andrew Doolan Best Buildings in Scotland um, Award. So what I would like to do is just, first of all, give you a little bit of background about the, the cinema. It was built in 1939, just before the outbreak of the Second World War, and it operated as a cinema up until the early 80s, when it then um, lost much of its glamour and appeal by being transformed into a, an amusement arcade. Um, it lay derelict for many years from the early 2000s through until the um, Friends of the Burke Cinema, which is now the Trust, uh, bought it in 2009 with a grant from the Town Centre Regeneration Front Fund, a Scottish Government grant. Um, we raised in total £1.8 million and we had to do that by the end of January 2012. Uh, and we then started, or Robin's design team then started work on it in April 2013, uh, 2012, and um, the doors reopened in 2013. So it went once again, it became once again a cinema, but the, the purpose had always been that it would actually be more than a cinema, that while cinema would be the core of the building, would be the hub, would be the, the main purpose of it, that actually it would become a community hub and that we would do much more than just be a cinema. The, uh, launch, the cinema was launched by our patron, Alan Cumming, whom some of you may recognize if you follow the, the Good Wife series or have seen him in the Bond films or um, other high profile um, Hollywood and Broadway shows that he's done. And what I thought I would do in talking about the cinema and would be to focus particularly on the community aspects of it, given the context of this conference, uh, rather than talk about the governance or, or other, uh, other um, aspects, and that I would divide it into the three main ways in which the community has been involved, or the three stages at which the community has been involved. The first of those was co the consultation period, when we were trying to gather evidence about um, the need for the cinema, how it would contribute to the local community, um, to show that it was worth funding this kind of effort. The second stage was uh, community involvement during the fundraising period. And then the third stage is as we are now, as an operating cinema, operating and cultural hub, and how the community is involved in that. So the first stage, the community consultation, we did. We had to do lots of things to be able to convince our funders, and in particular, I would say the big lottery, that um, the, the cinema was behind, that the community was behind the idea of a cinema, that um, there was a need for it, that it would meet some of the um, community needs that were identified. So we carried out a community needs assessment, which was done um, through a postal uh, questionnaire. We had lots of open doors days when we used the cinema um, building itself, even although it was virtually derelict, um, to invite people in to have a look at it and get to know about the project. Uh, we conducted a number of surveys, cold days spent on street corners, um, getting people to answer questions. Um, and we had a variety of public meetings. Um, and I noticed the question earlier from one of the ladies in the audience about how you get people to come to public meetings. And of course, it's not easy. We had displays, we, we had AGMs where we had um, speakers who came, um, well-known speakers who would come and talk about specific aspects related to the community and to, to architecture. But um, getting people along um, is always a challenge. One of the things we didn't realize in the early days was that we should be recording that data so that later on we would be able to say to funders, this is the number of people that answered our surveys. This is the number of people who came to our public meetings. These are the numbers of people who came to our open door sessions because they wanted 
hard data on how thoroughly we had researched the, the need for this, um, for the regeneration and refurbishment of this building within Aberfeldy. We also used the building itself as a means of raising money and perhaps our, our most um, important, if you like, uh, way of doing that, or our most productive way of doing that, um, it was to ask people to sponsor a cinema seat. Now, there are 104 seats in the cinema, and um, we were uh, putting them out for sponsorship at £1,000 a seat. So far, I think we have got about 46 or 47 seats sponsored, so it was not an insignificant um, donation to the, the total of 1.8 million that we had to, to, to raise. Um, however, most of our money did come from other sources, sources other than the community. And our two biggest funders were the Scottish Government through the Scottish Rural Development Programme, which is actually EC, or EU money, um, which donated about 650,000. And the big lottery, um, through its Investing in Communities program um, gave us about 550,000, uh, quite a significant proportion of which um, was for revenue funding. So we've got a little bit of a cushion during the early years of the cinema's operation um, to allow us to get onto our, on our feet and become um, you know, sufficiently income generating that we don't need additional support. So those were our two um, biggest funders. However, we got, I, I say smaller funders there, actually some of the amounts that, that some of these organisations gave were, were really quite large. Um, for example, Creative Scotland and SSE Griffin Wind Farm both gave us £100,000, which was the maximum that they could give. Um, and um, so there's a variety of, of um, sizes of donation there, right down to the Mary Andrew Trust, which gave us £500, which for them was, was a significant amount. The reason I put um, the Blenkinsop Trust and the Dunard Fund in a different colour is that um, these are funds which do not normally give to arts or um, cultural um, projects, but where we had people who lived in the local community who were significant members of these trusts. So for example, the um, family who have the Blenkinsop Trust have a holiday home in the area, as does the um, lady who is the uh, founder and a major backer of the Dunard Fund. So they were contributing money to a cause which would not normally fall within their criteria, but which because they were local and they had a special interest in the area, um, they diverted some funds to us. And the reason I've put the Foyle Foundation in a different colour is because it's the only body outside Scotland which we managed to get uh, a donation from. We approached several bodies that were not Scottish. Um, this was the only one that came up with um, a donation, which was £25,000. Um, and I think what it tells me, I, I think what this list tells you generally, is that the closer to your geographic location um, a donor is based, the higher the chance you have of getting a donation from them. So for example, the Ganachy Trust is based in Perth, and um, it's, as many of you will know, it, it has a preference for, to fund projects that are in Perth and Kinross. So, in a, the, um, so now we're moving on into the area of operations. Um, well, I, I seem to have missed a slide. Let me just go back in case I've lost it. So, no, it seems to have disappeared. I had one slide which showed the, um, the kind of funding that we did as a community, the kind of fundraising that we did as a community. Um, so it was the usual things of raffles, and um, we did a postcard auction, we had a charity concert, um, we, had mer we sold merchandise, we did a, a variety of things like that. Um, but I'd have to say that that probably only raised about 5% of the amount of money that we meet needed. And that includes the 46 or 47,000 pounds that we raised through the seat sponsorship. So, um, it, unfortunately, the community fundraising 
takes a huge amount of effort by a lot of people. It's very, very labor and time intensive. But in the end, it actually generates only a small proportion of the funds that are required. However, it is important for other reasons, and that's why we persevered with it. It's important because of the, um, the involvement that it, um, of getting people in the community involved in the project gives them something to do, make them feel they're making a contribution. And it also acts as evidence to other donors that the community is behind the project. So it was really important for those two reasons. Now that we're in the operational stage, having um, now been had our doors open for about 18 months or so, we have community involvement in other ways. Uh, we have a team of about 30 or so volunteers, for example, who act as ushers, who um, help with the publicity and marketing of events and the monthly programme. Um, and of course, the board of the trust is all, are all volunteers, as is the board of the, the trading company. We have a number of special interest groups who use the cinema um, for uh, meetings, for events, people, members of the community who hold parties there, um, birthday parties, special celebrations, and the cinema is, is used for that. And we also have activities which are organized by the trust itself um, for groups um, in the community, particularly those who may be at risk of social exclusion. So, for example, we have um, musical activities for preschool children and their, and their parents, our carers. We have yoga and music for uh, special needs children. Um, we have sing-along Sundays for the members, our, our senior citizens in the, in the community. Um, and this is in line with what we said to our donors we would do. We would make this a uh, community centre to which everyone would have access and there would be something for everyone in it. So we continue to, to keep the community involvement going and um, to, have, to open our doors to everyone who wants to use the building. So my final slide before I hand over to Robin. Um, just shows one of those uh, community events. This is our Thursday evening when we have uh, live music, um, just members of the community who play an instrument or who sing and come along every Thursday to enjoy playing together, making music together. And we have maybe about 30, 40, even 50 people at um, these Thursday evening events. So the cinema is indeed being used in the way that we envisaged. And, and we will continue to, to fundraise and we'll continue to, to generate new ideas to make sure that the building is fully used in the way that was always intended. And I shall now pass over to Robin to talk more about the architectural aspects of it. Thank you very much, Muriel, and thank you, John, uh, for inviting us to talk about um, this community-led uh, architectural project at a, a conference on archaeology. Uh, as you can see, um, Muriel has and continues to put a tremendous amount of time into the project, uh, along with a, a core group of other people, Douglas over here, uh, our uh, founder and inspiration, Charlotte Flower, and uh, a number of other people. and. Um, um, the community has benefited considerably from their efforts. I'd like to um, tell you a bit more about the, um, the history of the project and the story of the architectural process. So you've already seen this slide, but it's taking us back to a um, slightly weird proportion, or maybe it's just that I'm looking at it at an angle. Uh, it's just the angle, I think, yes. Um, so this was the, the, the point where uh, uh, we, we bought the building and we'd done some stabilization to stop the rot getting, uh, getting worse. Um, you can see at the top there uh, that the cinema is located in, a, a, in the corner of the main square in Aberfeldy, in, uh, really in a prime location. And for many, many years, oh, this is the, 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 the construction of it, not the demolition. That's how they used to deliver bricks in the 30s. But um, they built it in about six months. And you can see that there's a, a, a brick outer skin and a steel frame and steel 
uh, roof structures. So it actually opened just a few months before the uh, start of the uh, Second World War. And uh, this was the uh, initial opening in 1939. Um, rather grainy uh, photograph from the newspaper. Uh, but the auditorium at that time seated 470 people, um, which in a town of only about 1,500 people was um, quite a high proportion. And that was the layout uh, of the uh, auditorium originally. The, the, when we took the building over, the seating had all been removed. It had, had a rather unfortunate uh, conversion into an amusement arcade. Uh, but you can see on the left that there's a stage there, and that's where the screen was. Indeed, it was still there when we, we took over the, the, the building. But uh, the other um, associated services uh, were, were pretty minimal, and that included the heating, uh, which I understood was um, uh, virtually non-existent. People used to go with blankets and hot water bottles. Um, so, yeah, so this is going back to 2006. The building uh, was in the building at risk uh, um, register and uh, it looks pretty unprepossessing. Uh, uh, it really was a bit of a blight on the landscape and um, as, you, as you can see uh, uh, family amusement, so the amusement arcade. Um, popular place for the uh, disaffected youth to, to hang about in, in the town and uh, not really a desirable place for your children to, to go. Uh, and um, so the um, the friends were able to the project was uh, had, had moved along slowly and we got planning permission we got a little bit of funding from here and there from local private trusts from Perth and Kinross Council just to move it along do feasibility studies get planning permission and then um, it was primed ready to go when the uh, the the TCRF the town centre regeneration funds were announced. And so that really was a great leap forward. Uh, it provided funds so that um, the, the, the building could be purchased from a, a private developer who, who hadn't developed it. And um, well, that's a story in, in, in itself. But, uh, uh, and, and also, um, it enabled me to uh, appoint a full design team with uh, structural engineers, quantity surveyors, uh, building services, acoustic uh, consultants, and uh, we always had in the background the support of uh, Ron Ingalls, who is sort of Mr. Cinema Scotland. He, he he knows everything about cinema, and he was, along with Charlotte, was the other uh, in, source of inspiration right at the start. And here you can see we, we're sort of stripping out uh, what is actually a big space and uh, the uh, lurid orange panels, we discovered um, the paint had quite a high lead content. So the, the initial contract was to remove these uh, toxins from the, from the building. Now what you see here is um, uh, uh, 1930s electrics. So instead of a small rectifier component, this is what they had to do to convert the electricity to um, the DC that was required. So. The, the unit on the left in the cabinet is what we found there. And uh, I think I can just see, there's a, you get these sort of glass bulbs which have pools of mercury and there's, there's a sort of limb missing here. And then uh, when they're fired up, you get this incredible arcing uh, between it. So it was, it was real sort of science fiction stuff. Uh, but unfortunately there were globules of mercury all over the floor, so they had to be picked up with a pipette and, and, and extracted. And, um, so the, the building was, was stabilized and um, we, we were able to develop the design. <clears throat> um, we'd already gone through the feasibility study stage and considered uh, how we wanted to lay out the, the building to make the, the, the optimum use of the space available. Uh, we decided that, you know, in the business model, a 100-seater uh, digital uh, auditorium was what was uh, suitable. And um, uh, we concentrated very much on, on just prim principally on, on cinema, making a really good cinema experience, uh, which meant comfortable cinema seats, not sort of um, bleacher seating. Uh, there are other venues in the town that provide that sort of facility. and. Uh, uh, it's not the same. Uh, 
The front of house space is considered very important. Um, so going to the cinema is, 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 is a whole evening out. You know, it's not just you buy a, 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 some popcorn at the entrance and it, it's going with your family. It's a meeting place. It's, it's having a, a meal, having a drink. Oh, sorry, I'll just uh, back. So, uh, yeah, so all the service areas are sort of tucked into the uh, north side. Um, now, where are we at orientation? That's the east side, isn't it? I should know. And um, so this is the, the west. And um, we were able to make these large window openings to, to bring the light and the sunlight flooding into this uh, double height uh, um, uh, cafe bar area. And as I say, all the service areas are, are tucked in here on the, on the east side. What this plan doesn't show is that there's another level up these stairs to uh, all the plant which is tucked in under under the roof where there's limited headroom and uh, we we considerably underestimated the amount of space that we needed really for air handling equipment uh, Five minutes. thank you so here section through the auditorium and you can see that uh, uh, the tiered seating and uh, the in the background um, we've got these slightly wonky acoustic panels, and this is meant to be a, a sort of abstract woodland theme. Um, the, the, the word of the birks is the Sc Scots word for birch trees, and uh, we had a design, an interior design consultancy from Burrell Foley Fisher, who are very experienced uh, 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 um, cinema designers, and um, they came up with this theme, which we were able to follow through, uh, both with the manufactured joinery, which was made by Angus Ross Furniture, whose workshop was 200 metres away, so we were able to literally carry it round. And in the uh, entrance screen, where you need manifestation to stop people walking into the glass. Um, so these little touches we were able to, to, to carry through, along with the, the general colouring. The um, other design strategies uh, are to, to, to use passive servicing to, to minimise the amount of uh, mechanical servicing uh, necessary, so uh, good daylight, solar gain, and manual ventilation control, so lots of manual control for comfort. And then these, um, this uh, uh, is, is a big uh, sort of louvered window to let all the hot air out of the roof. In the auditorium itself, Rather than air conditioning, we went for a series of, of pipes um, uh, embedded in concrete, uh, which uh, where the uh, uh, ventilation, which sort of comes down here and is then distributed under the seats, could be diverted for those few days in the year when the uh, temperature gets above 24 degrees, which does happen occasionally. And it's very effective. And um, this sort of ties in, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Stuart Brand, who, who did the Whole Earth Catalogue. He published this book in 1995, How Buildings Learn. And uh, it's a very poor quality uh, image, I apologise for that. But it's really showing the, the sort of layers in a building, and it's showing that the, the skin, so in this case, the sort of brick uh, structure, it had a life of about 30 to 60 years. Well, it's 70 years in, in, in our case and the, the other services get replaced more frequently. So this was the 2013 opening and, and Charlotte opening it with these um, this sort of uh, woodland scene behind. Uh, so just um, coming back to the community aspect and the fact that what were previously empty shops are, are, are now um, uh, redeveloped and, and buzzing with life and uh, what's b it's been great to win some awards, but what's been really gratifying is to see the building uh, full of full of life, and also to be able to use it because I live in Aberfeldy. Um, the, Perth and Kinross Council were very supportive through the whole project. I have to say, um, the um, th we went to them and said, "Look, this is uh, uh, identified as poor visual amenity in the conservation area appraisal. Uh, we're redeveloping the cinema. Can you help with the?" Um, surrounding spaces, and they uh, re-landscaped, uh, repaved all this. They got rid of a lot of um, street kind of clutter, railings, and unnecessary signposts. And uh, they really, you know, s set it off. And there are now plans to upgrade the the whole square. Um, which um, unfortunately I missed the public exhibition a couple of weekends ago. So I don't know if there's anybody here from the council who knows about that. But I'd be interested to uh, to meet them. Um, just a couple of uh, quotations. Uh, Murray Grigger, 
who's um, the a documentary filmmaker, made a lot of documentaries about architecture. Uh, and um, he, he's one of his quotes when we met was, you wouldn't get planning permission for this building now. It doesn't fit in. It deliberately fits out in a way. And I thought that was an interesting comment because, um, you know, have we lost a certain confidence uh, in, 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 de in design uh, or is it just the, the planning system? Okay, thank you. Uh, but um, I was very fortunate uh, to spend half an hour with uh, <clears throat> Andy McMillan, who was the chair of the Andrew Doolan uh, jury uh, on, the, on the day that he sadly later died. And um, he'd been my external examiner uh, uh, 30 years previously. So uh, we picked up the conversation and he was, anyway, we stood in the square and he said, well, it's the most important building in the square. And um, I hadn't really thought of it like that uh, previously. So um, it, 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 that, was, that was very, very heartening. But uh, uh, I don't want to go on too much more. I've got one or two slides, but I'll maybe, uh, um, wind things up there really just to say um to, to thank you for uh, inviting us to 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 speak at the end of what's been a really fascinating uh, day of uh, presentations great uh, great variety and uh, um, it's been a great pleasure thank you very much <laughs>